Thank you so much, Josh, for your insights. It's always interesting listening to what you have to tell us about uh, Click. So my name is Brad Shields. Uh, I've been working uh, in the ClickView, ClickSense, and now ClickSAS space for the last 14 years. Uh, I tended to work in larger organizations uh, in insurance and government over the last 14 years, uh, so much so that I'm now part of the team that looks after insurance and government inside Decision Inc. I head that team up and have a a series of consultants that report into me uh, so that we can deliver great value in insurance and government over to you, Matt. Thanks, Brad. Uh, yeah, Matt Kinneen is my name. I was the head of the BI uh, practice lead uh, for, for the number of years. And as Brad said, we've now uh, reorganised our, our company along industry lines. And so I'm looking after the financial services sector within the industry, but still focusing very heavily on business intelligence and data. Uh, I too, like Brad, have been around the Click ecosystem for 14 or 15 years. So we've um, we've seen a fair bit of change in that time. Um, but today, what we're gonna do is give you a practical guide on how to build a data-driven culture in your organization, starting today. Now, when we speak with businesses, we hear a lot of things like, we want to have a data-driven culture. We want to monetize our data. We want to have data as an asset. And when we ask our clients and prospects to say, well, how do you plan to do that? Generally go a little quiet. And they're not really sure on how to go about that. They know that they want to do it. Everybody's talking about it, but how? So today we'd like to take you through Decision Inc's approach to creating a data-driven culture, the how. Look, a great example of this um, is Tesla uh, and how they're incredibly data-driven in all that they do. Um, and the, the example I want to share with you is around insurance. Uh, they understand how, where, and when its customers drive their cars and are able to offer car insurance at a rate much cheaper than their insurance competitors. Uh, that, that discount is up to 30% cheaper than their competitors can do because they understand what's happening with the cars and with the drivers, and they can take those risks and analyze them and, and work out the people that they can give cheaper rates to. Thanks. Uh, so the key to becoming a data-driven organization that everyone is that everyone needs data literacy. This extends, extends from the CEO right through the organization. It's convenient to think of data-driven organizations as having two communities of roles in, involved in information. These are consumers and producers. And if you look on the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see some of the capabilities that are required to become um, those information producers or information consumers. And of particular interest to me is that offline and online data integration capability. And, and I wanted to give you an example of how that's happened to me just in the last little while. I got my first COVID vaccination last week. It was a great example of something called hyper automation. Now hyper automation is around automating all the processes together uh, and, and the way it worked for the vaccination was that I went to a, a, a power app portal after I got my invitation uh, where I had to complete some basic details. And those things included a Medicare number and address and my phone number, my mobile phone number. And as part of that process, uh, the power app went and confirmed that my Medicare number was uh, legitimate. Uh, and then it sent me a text to confirm my mobile number. And so I responded to that. And once it was all completed, I received an email and text letting me know that I was eligible. The day before uh, the vaccination, I was reminded and asked to confirm that I was planning to attend. And the morning of the vaccination, I was provided with details about parking and the process the vaccination would take. When I arrived uh, at the parking area, which was quite remote from the hospital itself, uh, one of the staff members scanned the QR code uh, to register that I'd arrived. 
Uh, the process continued, but the key message to me was that it was organized and professional and filled me with confidence. Wouldn't you like your processes to be like that? And the last thing that's of interest to me was that the database the clinic used automatically integrated at the end of the day with the New South Wales government so that they knew the details of the vaccinations for the day. So that's one of the ways they can claim, oh, we, we vaccinated 24,000 people yesterday. Uh, I found it really a great, great process. And that's a great example of hyper automation. Now, one of the key changes within an organisation that needs to be made to become a data-driven culture is to build multi multidisciplinary communities. So not only are these communities for learning, it allows everyone, regardless of their position in the business, to access the data they need in a way that they can consume it. Now, it might be through a dashboard, it might be through a, a text message like Brad did when he went and got his, his COVID jab. Or it can be embedded, data embedded into an operational system that I go and use every single day. And what this is ensures is that people can make the decisions and take the actions to improve the business at the appropriate time and place. Now, as you can see in this slide, there are many different users of information across the top, both data producers and data consumers, as Brad has outlined. And each of those have very different data needs. Broadly speaking, they're broken up into information users, analytical users, or data science users. So this, it is the breadth of this community and the alignment for both learning and operating that's a key success factor in building a data-driven business. Now we want to take you through how it's an organisational cultural alignment that needs to exist to ensure that you can build a data-driven culture. Okay, it's important to understand the many facets required to build a data-driven culture. I'll start from the bottom of this slide and read out each point comment. So the first one on the left there is that it needs to be technology enabled and scalable. Um, as the organization progresses through this, it's really important that the technology enables the transformation that's needed. The second thing that I think is really important is the ability to build communities of people that have like interests or like needs or like roles. It needs to, the knowledge needs to be scalable. And one of the things that I think is really important in the click space is little coding snippets as a piece of scalable knowledge. There's no point reinventing something that we discovered how to do five, 10 years ago. Put that knowledge into the, the data enabled area and, and allow people to be able to come and look for the question that they want answers to uh, and find the coding that they need. The other thing that's really important is it needs to be personalized. It needs to change by role, by function, uh, and by the, the kinds of jobs that you're working on now. In, in my case, obviously in a consulting space, I have different clients and as those clients change, I need to have my learnings changed. So Decision Inc. has built a SharePoint instance and that's how we do it internally. And it, it gives us the ability to have 24 seven access to uh, the portal and to be able to go in and look for things. Um, you know, it, it could well be that someone in the UK has just solved the problem that I'm struggling to understand and can give me the code or can give me the tips that are needed. So that 24 seven access globally is really important to us. Our communities in DI are wide and diverse from knowledge of the technologies we use internally and with our clients to areas for data and statistical skills. Each of us is provided with a, a personalized learning plan for our roles, skills, experience, and the clients that we're dealing with.
Now here in the next slide, we talk about data literacy and how it's important for everyone to have the tools and the capabilities to speak the language of data. Now in our view, data literacy is the ability or to be able to read, work with, analyze and argue with the data. So these skills, once they're consistent across an organization, make the business so much more efficient as people from all teams are able to speak the same language. Now, I know sometimes the thought of having to learn a new language can be daunting to people, but the key to this process is to make it relatable to each individual. So the concepts such as signal and noise are explained with business specific references and examples to make sure those who are learning understand them in context. Now, the great news is we know how to do it. I mean, I've got a four-year-old and he's always learning new words and concepts that he's adding to his vocabulary all the time. So if we're just prepared to give it a go and understand that it would be uncomfortable for a while, but we will get there if we're consistent with it, we're able to, to achieve this. So the key areas are that data fluency, the analytical skills, simplifying statistics, creating some visualizations and communicate to a communicate a message, continuous learning, and ongoing mentoring to make sure that everybody improves. Just while this slide opens, um, it, it's important to think of continuous learning uh, across four different areas. I think it's really important for there to be continuous communication around these things. So internally to us with Decision Inc. Um, those kind of communications come on a regular basis, telling us new materials that have been added. But, but more than that, it's personalized for us. So uh, I'm very much uh, business intelligence focused. Um, I get involved in SAP occasionally, but I don't want continuous communication around SAP. I want continuous in communication around the things that are fundamental to my part of the business. I think the data literacy learnings are really important as well. And when we become a group of people working together on a particular area, area those learnings that we can share are really important. So uh, we have focused learning sessions where we all get together and talk about what we're learning. Um, I shared one of those uh, just this week or last week, I think it might have been last week, uh, where we were talking around um, some new approaches and technologies. Um, technology learning is important too. Um, likewise, uh, new technologies, uh, we're using Snowflake quite extensively now. And so more and more of the team um, is starting to learn about Snowflake. And, and the important thing about that is that as a DI client moves into the Snowflake space, um, I want to make that part of my learning at that time. So it's individual to me and I can learn more about Snowflake as my client appears in that one, in that space. An example for, for those of you who are listening to this webinar, your organization is, in, is planning to implement uh, robotic process automation, also known as RPA, within the next few months. Wouldn't it be nice for a set of learnings to be provided to you to get you up to speed before the project starts? And even better when this learning is customized for you based on your roles. So the next part here is about scaling knowledge. Now we talked before, Brad talked about the decisioning SharePoint portal that we use to help sure, ensure that we have a, a data-driven culture here at Decision Inc. And this slide gives you some more details about the principles that we use. But one of the key elements here is that there's so much information that's stored in individual <laughs> brains and minds and heads around the organisation. And sometimes they can feel really challenging to try and tackle that and put it somewhere that is able to scale. But if you are truly, uh, you know, driven towards making the data available to everybody, then you have to make a start on this. You've got to start sharing your knowledge. So knowledge needs to be part of the culture, part of the agenda, and needs to be constantly governed to ensure that it's relevant. 
So we do recommend you put careful thought into designing your program for your data-driven culture. And one of the key importance of designing to capture knowledge for the organization, as well as build that knowledge for your employees. Remembering, as we've said before, it's for the whole organization, including both information producers and information consumers. The process of gathering organization knowledge is not simple. You can think of the knowledge that is gathered in this slide as explicit knowledge. That is knowledge that's easy to capture in words. The difficult part of gathering that knowledge across the organization and developing a taxonomy that works for the organization, a taxonomy for a consulting firm will be different from one in insurance or finance. Different approaches, however, you are required for tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is that that you have gathered from personal experience, wisdom, insight, and is extremely difficult to gather in words. That is why mentoring is part of what we recommend for a data-driven culture. Mentoring allows the sharing of personal experiences in a way that can share that tacit knowledge. This is fundamentally important to organizational success. Now, I spoke earlier about building communities and how they help. Uh, they key to enabling businesses to transform their relationship with data, build relevance and influence and continue to build momentum through the learning process. And we believe if each community has got some simple components, such as a vision and goals, then it's really easy for people to understand if they should be part of that community or whether it's relevant for them. I mean, this is no different to what we do outside of work. You join a club due to a shared interest, whether it be football or bowls or books. You know, you might follow people on, uh, or people or groups on social media that are of interest to you, like the barbecue smokers group that Brad and I both enjoy. Now, the key is that the community is open to all, importantly, needs to have contributors from all parts of the business so that you can ensure that everybody's needs can be addressed within that community. So building communities of practice, it may sound a little simple, but there are many, many elements and characteristics. Gartner has broadly rolled them up into domain, practice, and community. So I wanted to look uh, really quickly at some of the group types that are typically put together in this kind of uh, situation. Um, a center of excellence. Um, we certainly have one inside the Decision Inc group and a competency center, which I kind of feel is more focused on the ability of us to use the technology uh, and a community of practice. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about those three, but in particularly the community of practice, um, Matt and I both belong to a global, global community uh, for business intelligence at Decision Inc. Uh, we meet via teams with this group on a monthly basis and we exchange stories of success and sometimes failure. We offer guidance for others and ask for tips. Being a member of this group helps me to be more data driven, but it also feels good to know how the rest of the team is working and progressing. You know, we build relationships with these people on a monthly basis. We exchange you know, stories about what's happening in our families and, and, and so on. It, it really brings us closer together. And part of the benefits of a data-driven culture is that it's more than just data-driven culture. It's around the people in our organization and, and, and becoming um, closer to those people. There are many types of groups, all of which have slightly different remits and, per and different purposes, but they're all part of the, the whole community. So thanks so much for your time today. I uh, certainly hope you got something out of the session. Um, we encourage you to get started on your journey and would love to assist you with that. Uh, I hope you've got out of this the fact that Brad and I really love talking about data and how data can be really embedded within your organisation and that it's a cultural transition that needs to occur to bring about a data-driven culture. So uh, you have the details of this uh, presentation as part of the, the, um, for the session. Also, don't forget to download any of the ebooks that are associated with this. Um, 
and enjoy the rest of the program. If you've got any further questions, we'd certainly love to take them. Please feel free to directly contact either Barat or I, and we'd love to have a discussion with you about this in the future. Thanks again.